This is from a series of interviews that I shot in January of 2021 for the Mind Body Soul documentary project where we will be hiking the Continental Divide Trail and exploring the effects that nature has on our well-being. To find out more about the project, visit mindbodysoulfilm.com. My name is Sonny. That's my nickname. It was given to me by my mother, Sonny Everhart. Uh, my trail name is Nimble Will Nomad. Go by Nimble Will generally. Uh, we're at a place called Flag Mountain, Alabama, which is kind of centrally located in Alabama between Montgomery and Birmingham. Uh, it's a very significant place to be, and I'm so blessed to be here. This is the mountain uh, that's the beginning. This is where it all starts. This is the beginning of the Appalachian Mountain Range. And this is the beginning of a really wonderful trail that people are finding out about and hearing a little more about and are coming to enjoy, and that's the Penhody National Recreation Trail starts here. Uh, on Flag Mountain. So I'm the caretaker here, been here about three years. I hiked through here on, a, on my southbound hike. I, when I did my northbound hike in 98 from Key West to Cap Gaspe, uh, the southern extent of Penhody Trail at that time uh, was a place called Porter Gap, which is way north of here. So I got to Porter Gap by hiking east of here through Alexander City and Goodwater. So I hadn't even heard about Flag Mountain, but later I was told that I should have come over and, and hiked through here and should have hiked Flag Mountain. So when I did my southbound in 2000, 2001, I made a point of coming here from Porter Gap and not going east of here to connect to the Florida Trail. I hiked down through here and I climbed Flag Mountain uh, on December the 14th, the year 2000. So December the 14th, the year 2000, I climbed this mountain. I leaned my head and cradled it in my arms against the stones up there and leaned against that tower and wept for about 10 minutes knowing that I had accomplished my hike of the Appalachian Mountain Range. Spent some time up there on Flag Mountain and I just was totally taken in and enamored by the place. It's just such an, an amazingly uh, different and special place. This mountain has some form of energy uh, that our senses can't really track or identify with, but within our heart and our minds, we know that energy is there because we can not physically feel it now, but there's, you, you understand what I'm saying? This mountain exuded that energy and I, I was just captivated by it. And I whispered or said to myself at the time that someday I'm gonna come back here. I don't know when or for what reason. Uh, well, Alex, I've been back here three years now as caretaker of this mountain, and it's just such a blessing. Tell me about your hikes. I wanted to do a lot of hiking uh, for many years. I'm an outdoors person. I'm Huck Finn. I was raised up in the Ozarks up in Missouri. And as a child, I was able to roam the woods and the streams and be outdoors, and I was captivated by that lifestyle and uh, life got in the way as quite often it does for all of us. But in the year uh, 1998, I had the opportunity to put on a backpack because I was retired then and that uh, I was age 59 at the time, uh, was able to put a backpack on and I went down to uh, the southernmost extent of the Florida Trail in Florida and I started north and during that hike of the Florida National Scenic Trail I decided I wanted to hike the Appalachian Trail. So I heard about some trails that were in Alabama so I just decided well, I'm just going to keep on going when I finish the Florida Trail I'm just going to keep hiking. 
So that year, I not only hiked the Florida Trail, which is a National Scenic Trail, but I also hiked the Appalachian, or I like to refer to it as the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> uh, so in 98, I hiked what has become known now as the Eastern Continental Trail. So that was a 4,400 mile journey in the year two, in the year 1998, and I enjoyed that so much that I returned uh, in the year 2000 and did a southbound hike, which included a through hike of the Appalachian Trail and the Florida Trail again. Uh, and I returned then that year, next year, to Newfoundland to hike the Long Range Appalachian Mountains. No one had hiked any of that up there at the time. But there was some trail and a lot of road walking and some incredible mountainous uh, exposure and uh, scenery that I had never even dreamt of seeing that I was able to take in. So that was kind of the way I cut my teeth to get started with it. And then it just so happens over the next six or seven years that I had hiked enough of the National Scenic Trails, unbeknownst to me at the time, but I finally realized that I was within three or four trails of completing all 11 of the National Scenic Trails. So then I just set my mind on going ahead and completing them. I'd already completed the Triple Crown by that point. And I'd become friends then, and the photographer we talked about again a while ago, Bart Smith, he had completed all 11 of the National Scenic Trails also. So he was working, starting to work on the National Historic Trails. So we got together and after we had hiked the uh, Oregon Trail, we hiked quite a bit of the Colorado, the, uh, excuse me, the California Trail together, uh, the Mormon Pioneer Trail we hiked together. Uh, and then the last one we spent quite a bit of time together on was the uh, Pony Express Trail. So I've hiked all 11 National Scenic Trails and the six major trails of westward expansion, the Pioneer Trails. Uh, they would be the Lewis and Clark, which I've hiked it twice, about a distance of some 5,000 miles. Uh, the Santa Fe Trail is is one of those. And then of course, the most famous one I guess would be the California Trail, that would be your Gold Rush Trail. Uh, the Oregon Trail is, is one of them. Uh, I guess you'd call it section hiking that you piece together. I've hiked the circumference of the lower 48, that's a distance of about 19,000 miles. That would be all four corners and all four sides of the lower 48 and you add all that together, it's about 19,000 miles. Another trail that runs for about 11,000 miles, uh, the C to C, have you heard of that trail? The C to C trail starts up at the Canadian border, comes down and picks up part of the Appalachian Trail, goes over and joins in with the, the North Country Trail and then connects to some extent with the Lewis and Clark and then the Pacific Northwest Trail. Uh, for all practical purposes, I've hiked the Sea to Sea Trail, uh, 11,000 miles of that or whatever it adds up to. Uh, I've done what I labeled the Triple O. The Triple O would be your Ozark Trail, the Ozark Highland Trail, and the Wachita Trail. I did that as a through hike with about two, three hundred miles of road walking to hook them all together in 2011 and uh, that trail adds up to about 1100 miles and a bunch of other goofy odds and ends stuff in between. Three years ago I got a wild idea that I wanted to, <laughs> when I was a, a youngster, uh, got my first vehicle, it was a 50, 1953 Ford. I drove quite a bit of old Route 66 and the nostalgia of that and just looking back and the memories of that, I decided, well, I'll just go walk that puppy. <laughs> so 
So three years ago, I went to the Loop in downtown Chicago, and I put my backpack on, and I walked the tarmac and the concrete for 2,300 miles to the Santa Monica Pier in Los Angeles, 121 days. But that's the last hike I did. That crazy road walk was the last one I've done. That kind of sums it up, I guess. Have you kept track of your miles that you've hiked? Nah. You, uh, you disappoint me. Normally, you, 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 dis you disappoint me. Normally, that's the first question everybody asks. No. <laughs> and yours is it's down there, third or fourth question. I just have to get that one that, that, <laughs> Again, I, that's fine. I, I have no idea. I, that's not what this is about. Why did you start these hikes later in life? To me, my priorities are certainly different than what yours are and, and what you seek in life. But there was a time in my life when the important things with my family, providing security for my wife and my children, uh, being successful, making money, uh, being on the board of directors of this company or the chairman or the president of the chamber or one of these other things were important in my life at that time. And the least important thing then, or probably, again, that I didn't long for it, but my desire to go seek and be part of nature was the last thing that was on that list of priorities. So I don't know where you got it on your list of priorities, but <laughs> uh, I'm a retired optometrist, eye doctor. <laughs> I'm an outdoors person. You've been to the doctor's office. <laughs> you st you're stuck in a little cubicle with no windows. And that was my life for 30 years. Yeah, it, so, it was a satisfying and enjoyable career, but yeah, it's a whole different deal. <laughs> You've heard this old saying, I'm sure everyone's heard it. Uh, the most important things in life aren't things. So, yeah, I've, and that's part of the problem, I guess, with our consumer oriented society that we have is the more things we have, the more successful we are. But uh, that's not the case at all, at least that's my opinion. Every year I had the successful life, I had the successful career, I had the half a million dollar house down the quarter mile driveway through the live oak trees on the lake. I've had the cars, uh, I've had the motor homes, I've had the boats, I've, I've owned the real estate, I've been there, I've done that. The old expression, I got that t-shirt, okay. Uh, I tell my friends, now Alex, it, every year I got less and less, I'm talking about physical things now, every year I have less and less and every year I'm a happier man. I can back my pickup truck up to that little old rundown cabin with no windows and doors in it down there that I live in, and you give me 20 minutes, let's, uh, let's see, could you do this? Give me 20 minutes, I can back my pickup truck up to that old cabin down there, and I can load every physical possession I have in my life into the back of that truck, and I can go down this road and I'll be gone. So I tell my friends, every year I have less and less, and every year I'm a happier man. I'm gonna value my friendship no longer than I've known you. It's gonna be important to me. I, I'm, I sincerely mean that. It has nothing to do with what you own or what you have. It's what we have collectively between us with the time we spent because we spent that, that time's gone, and it'll never be back again. So what have we purchased with that time? Have you changed as your priorities changed? I've been an extrovert all my life. I'm a, I hope I've been able to overcome it 
to the point where you have to be told and wouldn't believe it when you're told. But I was a class A personality. You know what that means. Uh, good Lord, I hope I'm not anything near a class A personality anymore. I want to be easy going, laid back, uh, patient, understanding, forgiving, uh, not judgmental, uh, comfortable in my person, uh, not assertive, but strong and meaningful when I greet you and interact with you. Uh, certainly not arrogant, which we see manifested in great volumes in our society today. But I was a type A personality, and I certainly am not anymore. At least I hope you'll agree that you sure don't look like you're a type A personality anymore. Did you find happiness in these changes? The happiness that you have or enjoy or you seek or you learn to kind of appreciate uh, Sam Clemens said this. He said, happiness is not a thing in itself. It's just in comparison to something that's not near as pleasant. So if you're going to appreciate something that you label as happiness, it has to be bracketed and it has to be uh, bounced off of other things that would create meaning for that. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. So if you're out on a cold, rainy day and your your back sore and you got blisters on your feet and you keep insisting and constantly shouting to yourself in your brain, you dumbass, what are you doing out here? Okay, uh, it's those kind of days that stir in with the beauty and the joy of the sunshine and the vistas and all the other things that give you the happiness. But you can't appreciate that joy and that happiness, that part of what we would label happiness, if you don't have it, have something to bounce it off of. You gotta be able, and that's what, uh, that's what Mark Twain meant. He said, <clears throat> you gotta have this over here before you're gonna understand or appreciate this over here. I've glommed onto a hell of a big chunk of it, okay? <laughs> yeah, lots of experience. So the wind and the sun and the heat and the blistering uh, bubbles in the tarmac uh, going down the road and the semi-trucks and the end of that ribbon you can see is seven miles away and, and you don't think you're ever going to get there. Uh, all those negative uh, emotional experiences that you just as soon deal without stir into the mix. That's the seasoning that makes the sauce that creates the the gruel or the mix of whatever you want to call it tasteful where, where that taste is there and it means something. If all you've had was coddled all your whole life which we know folks have been called their whole life, how are they going to understand what happiness is? Did you seek this out on purpose? Well, we're, we're, we're going we're to get in the weeds here now, okay? Because you said you were going to talk about this, and I guess we're going to start talking about it. Uh, yeah, we've all got baggage, and the older you get, the bigger your baggage is. And I had a bunch of baggage, uh, things that I wasn't necessarily proud of, situations and occurrences and events in my life that I would have changed. Look, I'm going to tell you something, and I don't mean this nasty. You're a jerk, but you ain't near as big a jerk as I am, because I've lived a lot longer, so I'm a bigger jerk than you are. And again, don't be angry at me for telling you that. But we have these situations and occurrences and times in our life, the way we treated our friends or the way we treated our loved ones or the way we treated our family or one of our dearest 
family members that we love, how we might have shot our mouth off to them or said something that we should never have said. But once it's said, you can't take it back. But then you regret that the rest of your life. That goes in that bag. That's part of that baggage. And I think part of the aging process, and you're just approaching that. You're just starting to get into what happens as you get older. Uh, we become more sensitive. We become more... Uh, we question more who we are and what we are. What's this about? Why am I here? And why have I been such a jerk in my life? So you got that baggage. Uh, I told you we we're going to get in the weeds on this, okay? You've, you've got that baggage that you're carrying, and you say, well, I can handle this. I'm a strong person. I can deal with this. I have ways within my own capacity, my own abilities, my own reasoning, my own thoughts, my own emotions, uh, my own moral uh, fiber. I have within me the ability to deal with this myself. I don't need any help. I can handle this. But then tomorrow comes and next week comes and another month goes by and a year or two goes by and you're getting older and that hasn't gone away and you haven't dealt with it. And this baggage, this burden that you're lugging and you're carrying along eventually gets to a point where it's impossible to pick up and carry and to lug. Mentally, physically, emotionally, you can't deal with it. So what do you do? You, you say, well, Let's look at this a different way, old man. How about you seek some help? And I'm not talking about help that's gonna come through someone's education uh, that they graduated from this school of psychology or anything like that. Not that sort of help, because some of us have already sought that and have found out that that might help, but probably we're right back where we were to start with the next year later and your own personal life, I have no idea if or when or you had to deal with any of that, but I did. And I, I received no satisfaction, no closure in the suffering I was going through mentally and, and emotionally. So I, I thought, well, let's just put a pack on and let's go out with nature. Let's let's seek and immerse ourselves in another medium that's out there that we know is out there because we've heard and we've been taught and we probably have an instinctive feeling down deep that nature and God have something in combination that we may, not with our senses, uh, our physical senses of seeing or feeling or smelling or hearing or tasting, but within our heart and in our mind, we know that there's some connection there between nature and, uh, and what we would call God. So I sought that out and I went out there and uh, I liked it. How has that changed your life? There's three levels that we exist on in our life, our physical life. There's three levels, one is maybe not a little more ephemeral and maybe not as physical, but it's there because we can accept it and go for it and be part of it if we want to. But the three planes that, that and this is what we do when we hike, we, we immerse ourselves in at least two of these planes in a very, very um, concentrated way. The first plane is the physical the physical plane. If you're gonna put a pack on your back that weighs 20, 30 plus pounds, and you're gonna to try to walk through the mountains and valleys of 14 states on a trail that we call the Appalachian Trail, you're gonna probably figure that this is an incredible challenge. 
This is the physical challenge. And if you can accomplish that or achieve that, then you've really done something big. So that's one of the two main planes that we have to deal with in life but and concentrate when we're on the trail because to go to work, we just walk to our car. And to go to lunch, we just walk to the cafe. Uh, and at home, we just walk to get to the toilet. But we don't walk 15, 20, 30 miles a day like we do on the trail. So the physical challenge, that plane, that one of the three planes I'm going to talk to you about, is the one that we think is the most difficult to overcome. The second of the planes is the mental. So we've got the physical and the mental now that we have to deal with. Uh, I don't know if there's been any actual, really honest to gosh, studies done about this, but the failure rate, especially on the Appalachian Trail, used to be enormous. I don't think it's quite as bad now as it was, but the failure rate on the AT used to be in, in around 80%. So you're telling your friends, I'm going to go hike the Appalachian Trail, and your friends tell you, you probably ain't going to make it because eight out of ten of the people that, that take a crack at that thing never, never, ever make it. And that's pretty much the extent of what we delve in and in, in exploring what that is. We just know that eight out of ten people... Uh, and it's still real high, maybe 60 or 70 percent even to this day, even with the good gear we have and, and the training and the knowledge and, the, and the, the, uh, the resources that are out there that we can avail ourselves to to improve our chances of success. I think the failure rate is still probably somewhere near 60 or 70 percent. But I don't think what beyond that, what has really been studied and delved into is why. Why did, what happened to you? What, how come you quit? I think that eight out of ten of the people that actually fail or quit the trail give it up not because of the physical challenge. They give it up because of their failure to uh, overcome and to master the mental challenge. Here's what happens. As you put a pack on, you're dealing with that grueling day-to-day -day grind. But with time, you overcome that, so the physical demands that you're dealing with become less. However, you're having to deal also with the mental demands of being out there. Uh, you're alone. Uh, you haven't seen your family. You've been called selfish because you're doing this. You should be uh, back at work. You should be taking care of your family. You should, whatever your other responsibilities that other people tell you you should be involved in, you're very selfish to go out and to just take all this time to yourself. Uh, you shouldn't be doing that. So you got all, you got all these things working on you mentally. That problem increases with time. And your ability to deal with it and overcome uh, what the mental challenges are in a hike become bigger and not smaller. Uh, in real life, we deal with that uh, by we immerse ourselves in, in a way in society where all the confusion, all the noise, all the racket, all the... Uh, peripheral things that that we deal with from day to day keep us from thinking about who we are as a person. And this gets back to you being a jerk, okay? And it gets back to me being a jerk. And when you're out there for hours and days and weeks and months, you don't have the distractions that you can go to that'll take your mind off of that. You, you jump in your car and you go downtown, you pick up the phone, you call your friends, you turn on the TV because you don't want to think about how you treated your mother when, she, when you were a child, how you were nasty with your really good people that were your friends and considered you to be a friend, how you dealt with them sometimes and the, the really nasty person that you are that made you into the jerk that you are. 
you can't escape those moments and hours and days on the trail. So it's in your head, it's in your mind, and after a while you say, I, I can't handle this anymore, so what do you do? You quit. But you didn't quit because you had blisters on your feet. You didn't quit because your back was hurting. You didn't quit because your pack was so heavy and you didn't want to carry it anymore. You quit because you couldn't deal with the mental challenges that are part of an increase day to day when you're hiking. The third plane, uh, and this is your third plane, is the spiritual aspect of it. And that's coming right about, right around 360 back to where I started discussing how we were going to go into the weeds on this. Uh, we know that there's a connection between God and nature. Uh, and you can dispute that, I guess, but to me it's unequivocal. Uh, you can't go out here and, and, and see this sunset, which is beautiful again tonight. You can't go out here and, and see God's great, uh, uh, all the beautiful things he's created or she's created, whoever God is, uh, that we experience when we're with nature and not realize there's a connection there. So to be a successful long distance hiker or to be successful in life, comparatively, okay, you have to, succeed on the physical. You got to take care of yourself. You have to be healthy or you can't do the things you want to do. And you have to manage or at least feel like you're managing the, the mental challenges from day to day. Uh, and those of us that are able to do that and we consider ourselves successful long distance hikers because we've overcome the physical and the mental challenges of it opens up this third realm if we want to delve into it, and it's been there all along. Uh, we see it every moment, every hour, every day, every week. We're on the trail, we see the connection that's there that we know deep down in our heart exists between nature and God. And if we want to open ourselves up to that, uh, it's there for us to do. Uh, we've got down off of that pedestal that we've elevated ourselves to as being such a great person because we know we're not a great person and we've learned to overcome the frailties and the, and the failures that we've had in life or we wouldn't have been successful on the trail. We'd have quit. So if we can uh, at some point and decide in our life that we want to do this, then we can join in that journey with God and that's what's out there. So you got the the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. And to make a hike complete and a journey complete and a lifetime complete, uh, we have to be successful in all three of those. Those are the three planes that we, that, that we function on. Mm -hmm. And day to day, they're not near as intense as we subject ourselves to on the trail. Mm -hmm. And as in life, we can either succeed or fail. And I think I've been a success at it. And it's brought me to a point where I think I can impart and understand a little bit of what wisdom is. Uh, because with that comes humility, which has to be part of what your life is. Uh, and I'm comfortable and completely at ease now with who I am as a person. I've asked for and been forgiven for being a jerk because I couldn't handle that myself. I can't forgive myself for all the things I did that were wrong. My friends can forgive me and my family can forgive me, but I couldn't forgive myself. And so I searched out the realm and the source that I needed to deal with uh, my failures. And I've been forgiven of those failures now. So with that, I believe, has come some degree of wisdom. You heard of a guy by the name of Benton Mackay? <laughs> I, I say that jokingly. We all know who Benton Mackay is. Uh, Benton Mackay is the founder of the Appalachian Trail. Uh, 
one of the most famous things, at least in my opinion, of what Benton said was, uh, <clears throat> we need to stop and really look and see what we truly see. And if you can stop and look and see what you truly see, as Benton said, and I didn't understand that, but now I understand it. <clears throat> I don't know who said this, but it's, it's a fairly famous saying that uh, God hides things by putting them right in front of us or all around us. He hides all these things so we can't see them because they're right there in front of us. <laughs> And nature's that way. If, if we can truly open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to see what we see, then we'll understand maybe the best that we as humans can understand what the relation is between God and nature. What have we lost in modern society? Are, are you familiar with an author? Have you read any of Sigurd Olson's stuff? Sigurd Olson. Okay, well, I, I'd encourage you. Uh, I'd encourage you to go and and, uh, and look at some of Sigurd Olson's uh, works. And he's said a, a number of very interesting and thought-provoking things in his writings. And one of the things that really struck me, he said, one of the the greatest losses in in our life now and in our lifestyle and in our existence is just a pure loss of silence. Why is it good? <laughs> yeah. We know why and the noise and the racket and the confusion and, 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 and all that clutter is not good. The earth revolves around the sun in silence. Uh, the leaves branch out on the tree in silence. Uh, all the great things that we can experience over time in nature pretty much occur and exist in silence, uh, but not our lives and not our way uh, and not how we uh, exist day to day. Uh, the last thing in our life anymore is silence. Do you think people are aware of that? You sh yes, they are. You know why they're aware of it? Because occasionally, very seldom, but occasionally, we place ourselves in an environment where there is silence. And you know what our reaction is to that? It's one of utter sheer fear. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just one of utter sheer fear to be exposed to silence because we are totally unfamiliar with it. And when we go out in nature and when we're out there, except for that occasional jet at 30,000 feet that's going over, uh, and immerse ourselves in nature, then we expose ourselves and become more familiar and more at ease and more comfortable with silence. Because that's one of the things that, I don't know, I had trouble dealing with it to start with and not realizing what it was that I was so uncomfortable about and being out on the trail by myself in silence. And yet that's what it was. And once I realized that, uh, I was able to address it and, and over time deal with it to the point now that if I have silence, it's a joy in my life. If you're going to be happy, you're going to be comfortable, and you're going to have a fulfilling life, uh, you're going to have to have some help. And that help comes from the spiritual realm. It has nothing to do with the smart guy you are mentally or the strong person you are physically. It has nothing to do with either of those two things. It's that third plane, the spiritual aspect of living. And there's a lot of that that has to do with silence. Do you think nature is for everyone? Is nature for everyone? Uh, can you go through life without experiencing nature? Uh, 
we make great efforts in our big cities to set aside two acres somewhere where we can have some trees and some plants and some things that we would say are natural. Uh, with the light ricocheting and bouncing off of our 200 story building over here, <laughs> that is not nature. Uh, I believe we all seek that, that we'd like to take, and this is uh, describing it in a different way, that path, we'd like to take that path, not a physical path that we would say, here's the sides of it and there's the path, but I think in our lives we all seek the path of uh, exploring and being part of or immersing ourselves in nature. I think it's a nat, it is, don't you think it's a natural instinct? We've got this thing burning, this fire that we've got burning in our gut. Do you know what that is? But it's there. It's our desire and our hope and our dream just to be free, to have a free life, uh, to go where we want, do what we want, think what we want experience what we want, enjoy what we want, uh, find satisfaction in all the things that we want, uh, and a million other things that come together that creates that, that ember and that fire that's burning down in our gut. And I don't see how in the world you're gonna uh, isolate nature away from that, you can't. So I think it's instinctive of all, in all of us, it's an instinctive desire. You got kids in the inner city that don't even know what dirt is, all they've got is concrete. Uh, and they may have a playground, but they got ground up rubber there around the swings and things. <laughs> you don't, don't even know, go through their whole life and never even get their feet dirty in real dirt or mud or anything. That's, it's a sad deal. See, that's, I didn't realize until recently, well, a few years ago at least, what a wonderful childhood I had. I'd get up at first light with mom and she'd fix a bowl of cereal or fry a couple of eggs for me or whatever. And I'd say, mom, I'm going to Jimmy's today and uh, we're just gonna go play today. And, Mom wouldn't say a word. I'd go to Jimmy's. I'd be gone all day. She'd know that I'd be back at supper, okay? She knew I was going to come back. Kids can't even be out of the sight of their parents for a 10 seconds anymore or out of the sight of someone responsible for them in one way or another that their parents consider they're going to be safe. I was gone all day from daylight to dark in my childhood, and my mother had the least concern about my safety and my, my well-being was the last thing in her mind. What a beautiful childhood that I had, the freedom that I had and the, the joys that I, that I had. I wasn't in you know, some jungle where somebody's gonna beat me up if I walk around the corner. It's, it's just frightening now. I, I just, I can't even comprehend. And yeah, so when you say people are separated from nature, I was immersed in nature as a child. Is nature a perfect system? You walk out this door and you go out into the woods here, you're going to see all kind of disharmony. You're going to see <clears throat> trees that have been blown down. You're going to see bits and pieces of other things that were part of, of life uh, with nature that's destroyed or dead or whatever. and. So you can see that disharmony maybe, but in all of that, there's an order because of life that springs up from the soil uh, and grows and matures. And most of this in a fairly slow and long enduring fashion, which again brings me a lot of satisfaction in trying to seek uh, patience in my life to see how nature patiently deals with things. There's another medium there, and we talked about this a little while ago, where 
uh, you can feel this this urging, this tugging that we have uh, that's constantly there, maybe subconsciously and at times consciously, that we are seeking out what this is and yet uh, never really being satisfied in our physical mind that uh, we can truly understand or see or feel or smell or hear what this is. It's another realm and uh, the way I've dealt with that is I just accept it. And so when I look at nature, when I see the trees, when I see what seems to be disharmony and disorder, there is an order to it. There's an incredible order to it. Uh, the ability of nature to continue to reproduce itself uh, as far as what we see physically out there, the trees and the animals and the plants and, and the spheres spinning around above our heads. Uh, boy, oh boy, I wish you could explain that to me. So we have to have faith I've been able to satisfy, and the word's not curiosity, but just, the, again, the instinctive desire to find some meaning and some reason and some order to all of this, that I'm content with that. And I've found joy and satisfaction and peace in what nature presents to me. Uh, God hides things by placing them all around us. And that's not our physical eye seeing that. That's not our physical ears or hearing hearing that or tasting it or smelling that. Again, it's, a, it's another realm that's within us and God is within us and it's there for us to uh, accept or reject. And we can reject it or we can gain through faith uh, peace with that and at 82 years I've managed to arrive at a point in my life where I'm at peace with the innate and the instinctive and the inborn uh, manifestation of what God's created within me. What keeps you going into your old age? Most answers to most questions if they are accurate and truthful and meaningful uh, and get to the crux of it are usually very simple explanations. And so the answer to your question is just one word, just one word. The word is passion, passion. And that can be all encompassing if you want to look at it just purely across the spectrum in the realm of life if we just are passionate about living. Uh, the guy works for 50 years, he retires, he gets the watch of the little plaque to hang on the wall, he goes and sits in his rocking chair and two months later, two months later he's dead. He just was never passionate in life about anything. And if you can maintain, or really you can create, and, and it's not a matter of kidding or fool, fooling yourself about it, but you can actually uh, bring into your life these kind of feelings where you're passionate about. Maybe not just living, but within the categories of all the things that combine and come together to create what we call living, to be passionate about something. This is the thing that, that, that makes me vital. This is why I'm vital. This is why I'm active. This is why I'm alive. This is why I'm enthusiastic. This is why I'm energetic. This is why I have a positive attitude. This is why I have a great outlook on life. You got to be passionate. In a very narrow spectrum, it's hiking. I enjoy backpacking, being out with nature the challenge uh, and being able to thing that drives me and keeps me going and just just a pure and can can you not see this too just a passion for life for living 
How many people you know in their 80s that give a damn about much anything anymore? It's just sad. It's a sad situation. And it's not necessarily that they've given up. It's just that their narrow spectrum of what life is anymore has shrunk around them. The important thing is that you maintain a love and a desire and you seek all the greatest uh, that you're capable of seeking in your lifetime on any given day, in any given moment, in any given experience. If you have a passion for all of that, you're going to live a long time, son. One of the other things that's such an important factor to me now and more and more every day, and you experience it here just the short time you've been here is, is just the satisfaction and the enjoyment I take out of uh, uh, being a good influence in other people's lives. These people that came here today sought me out because they've heard about me as a person. And when they come and spend time with me and they leave with a smile on their face and, and having known they spent some time with somebody that uh, perhaps has had a positive influence on their life. That is so incredibly rewarding to me. Uh, I mentioned a little while ago how I was accepted into this community and, and how I've become such close friends with so many people around. And uh, in my life now, that is so fulfilling. And to have the friends I have and the people that care for me sincerely and truthfully in a loving way care for me as a person. Uh, I could have rejected them. I could have shunted them off. I could have maybe never ever met them or ever made any attempt to become a friend with these people. Uh, the fact that I've been able to influence people and have a positive influence on people's lives that the guy stuck behind the desk at age 35 with the, all the mortgages and the car payments and all the debts and, and everything he's having to deal with in his life, that, uh, that he can see that here's a guy at age 82 that's still really going and cranking and having fun and enjoying life, is vital and is healthy and, and has a great outlook. and. Uh, I can look up to this guy and by God, maybe there's, there's something down the road for me too. That sort of a satisfaction uh, in my life has been so incredibly important. Uh, the giving and the receiving aspect in our lives, uh, it's better to give than to receive. What is, what, what's that? I'm looking for a word there. So we all want to give. That's the fun in life is to, to be giving. Uh, and the revelation that came to me and what I finally understood is that if you're going to be giving and we all want to give, somebody's got to be on the receiving end. Somebody's got to be there to, to accept the gift or to, to receive the gift. And I, I, I'm convinced, thoroughly convinced that in my life now, more than ever, and it's going to continue, I guess, I've been placed here in front of you and everyone else that has this desire to give. Uh, it's more precious to give than it is to receive. That somebody's got to be on the receiving end. Somebody's got to be there. And uh, what a revelation that was to me, because there's no way in this world that I can ever, ever, ever repay the goodness and all the great things that other people have done for me. And that's their giving to me. And they got, they got satisfaction and joy out of doing that. And uh, so I was there as a receptacle on the receiving end. And you can reject it like you did to start with, or you can finally start to realize there's something going on here that's bigger than me and that guy and what just happened and him wanting to be good and to, to give me something. And you, if you deprive the person of that, then, you know, that's not good. You, if you read this second book especially, I struggled with that big time. Uh, I had a poor couple driving an old beat up vehicle with two kids. The guy gave me a hundred dollar bill. 
He gave me a hundred dollar bill. What are you going to do? I tried shoving it back. I tried rejecting it. I went through all of that pain and agony of being on the receiving end of something where you don't understand what's going on. Uh, but I accept that now, and I was told by friends that I've explained this to later that you that you you're a jerk. You, you fooled that poor family, you know. You didn't need their money. They they needed that, not you. It was getting it was close to Christmas time, for God's sakes. And uh, oh, I had a hell of a time dealing with that. But now I understand it, and uh, the good that those people got out of greeting me and meeting me and and befriending me, and giving to me, was a real joy in their life. It had nothing to do with a hundred dollar bill. That was just the transfer of the energy that goes through that sort of a of an experience. We can get into this way, way deep in the weeds. Uh, this is something now that I think the good Lord has placed on me. Burden's not the right word. Entrusted. It entrusted me with what I do and who I am and how I am and how that manifests in other people's lives. I've been entrusted with that responsibility. It, I haven't been burdened with that. I've been entrusted with it. And again, here, <laughs> it has to do with your faith. Uh, it's the old saying, there's two sides to every coin. And, and the side I'm on, I think, is a, is is generated through my faith and uh, through what I know is good in life. And I've tried to bring that to the surface in, within me and to radiate out, radiate out through my countenance to you so you can see that who I am and what I am is truthful and sincere. And so when people come here and I interact with them or talk with them, I'm able to do that now naturally just like when the batter steps up there after practicing for 10 years swinging the bat, he's going to hit the ball, okay? He's just going to do it. It's a natural thing. and uh, It's been a journey. It's, a lot of it's been rocky. Been wet and cold and uphill. <laughs> I need to tell you about that. Uh, but the sun's out at the top and the view's incredible. And don't forget to subscribe here on YouTube and follow us on social media to stay up to date with this project.